Okay, so we're back on defenses for contract enforcement. So this is, <coughs> okay, there's, you know, there's been a valid contract or there's been offer acceptance and consideration. Um, so we wanna know what are some reasons or some rationale, some legal reasons people might have to um, avoid enforcement of the contract. So the first one that we'll discuss is capacity. So, and I've already discussed part of it, but when we have a contract made with a minor, that contract is voidable at the option of the minor. There is an exception that says it is not voidable if it is for necessities. So things like food, clothing, lodging, things like that. Um, it is voidable even if the minor misrepresents their age. Um, and then the second type of uh, capacity uh, that's discussed in the book is mental incapacity. So this is not just minors, this is everybody. So there's two options here. If the person has been judicially determined, so a judge has been called in and determined a person is insane or incompetent, that contract is void. This happens a lot more often than you think. So for example, if you have someone who is elderly or maybe not even elderly, my uncle was 55 when he was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. Um, very often, someone has to get called in, some family member has to get essentially a power of attorney to make decisions on their behalf, to oversee their finances, to oversee their person. And before that can happen, a judge basically has to come in and declare that person incompetent. Um, so it's actually fairly common that this happens with people that are um, have Alzheimer's or dementia. Uh, some family member has to come in because if you think about it, if they're not competent, they can't legally give power of attorney. It's not an enfor it's not enforceable. If they're not competent enough to determine that they need help or they need someone to act on their behalf, a judge has to do it for them. And very often by the time you get to that point, that person is not able to make their decision and their signature will mean nothing. So you have to get a judge to come in and declare them incompetent and appoint somebody to act on their behalf and to oversee their finances. So if that has happened, if they were to make a contract, it is void. If they have not been declared um, judicially incompetent or insane, then the contract is voidable at the discretion of the person who is incapacitated. What about intoxication or drunk people? The courts do not see this very favorably at all. In fact, I have read case law out there where someone um, sold their house on a, in paper, on a napkin, at a bar, they were drunk, uh, and a judge said, look, you got yourself drunk, you know, basically. Um, but technically, the rule is it is voidable at the option of the intoxicated person, but, and there's a big but, the other person must have reason to know that the intoxicated person did not understand his actions and was unable to act reasonably. That second part after the and is very difficult to prove. Um, but I have, like I said, I've read lots of case law out there and judges are, they do, they are not lenient on this issue at all. If you're drunk and you do something stupid for the most, most part, they're going to hold you to it. Um, <clears throat> legality or unconscionability. So if it's a contract for something that's illegal, like assassinating, you know, my mother-in-law, for example, um, that is void. If a contract can't be performed without a violating some other statute, it is void. A um, contracts that restrict contracts that restrict trade are generally not enforceable. Uh, a big one that you might think of is a covenant not to compete. So this is an employment contract that you would sign with your employer, basically saying you won't compete with them. These are enforced somewhat. There are a lot of limitations that are imposed upon them. Some states won't enforce them at all. 
Texas will, um, but there are there's time limitations and geographic limitations. So you can't just have someone sign a covenant not to compete that's you know indefinite and is for anywhere in the world. It doesn't work like that. They are enforced a little bit in Texas, but not very much. For the most part, any contract that restricts fray, the trade, um, not enforced. Um, unconscionability. So this is when a contract is so incredibly unfair that it's a violation of public policy to enforce it. Um, I've read a case out there in law school on unconscionability where you had a lady in Washington, D.C., and she did a lot of business with a um, one of those rent-to-own facilities, and she had gotten most of the furniture in her house from this rent-to-own place. And, you know, throughout, you know, I forgot the time frame. It was, you know, seven, nine years, something like that. You know, she had paid off pretty much everything that she had bought from this rent-to-own facility, but then she bought this stereo, and she missed one payment on her stereo, and the rent-to-own facility came in and took basically everything in her house that she had purchased from this rent-to-own facility, even all of her other things that she had already paid off. Um, because their contract said that once you miss a payment on one item, we can come in and repossess everything that you have purchased from our um, business. That contract was declared unconscionable. Um, even though she agreed to it, she signed her name, there was consideration and everything. Court said that is incredibly unconscionable and is not enforceable. Um, <clears throat> next offense, of course, is fraud. Okay. So with fraud, there are elements involved. Um, let's see, I'm gonna try to see. This is discussed on page 464 in your book. An actual or implied false representation of a material fact, okay? It can't be someone's opinion. It has to be an actual misrepresentation of a material fact. This roof is nine years old. Not, that roof looks like in pretty good condition to me, or it looks pretty new. Mm -mm. It has to be a misrepresentation of a material fact, okay? Not an opinion. There must be an intent to misrepresent, okay? So that intent element is important. There can also be something a little bit lesser than intent to misrepresent, something called gross negligence. It means it, a misrepresentation is made with a willful and reckless disregard for its truth. So you don't know for certain that that roof is um, nine years old or not nine years old, but you have a reckless disregard for the truth and you didn't actually look into it and you say, oh, it's nine years old because you didn't actually, you know, go and get the paperwork when you could have easily asked for the paperwork. So um, if there is gross negligence that's considered to be constructive fraud, which is still a type of fraud, um, there must be an intent to induce reliance. So you want the person to believe what you're telling them. That reliance was justifiable and the innocent party suffered damages because of it. <clears throat> the book talks about two different types of fraud, fraud in the inducement and fraud in the execution. So fraud in the inducement occurs when the defrauded party is aware of entering into a contract. So they know they're entering into a contract and they intend to do so, but the contract is procured by fraud. Okay. Um, fraud in the inducement is a voidable contract. Basically, it means there was some sort of material fact in the contract that was lied about, that was misrepresented. But they do know they are signing a contract. Um, and it is voidable at the option of the innocent party. Fraud in the execution is void. Fraud in the execution is where you don't even know you're entering into a contract. Okay? You think you are signing a release form for your son to go to the zoo, but in all actuality, 
you are signing a contract to sell your car, okay? Where you think you don't even know that you're entering into a contract. That is void, okay? Um, <clears throat> um, we have a mistake, okay? There are two different kinds of mistakes. We have either a mutual mistake or a unilateral mistake. So a mutual mistake is where both parties are mistaken about some material aspect of the contract. Um, a mutual mistake is a basis for rescission of the contract, okay? Katie has a truck she uses for business. Kurt offers to buy her truck. She agrees to sell it. Kurt accepts her price and pays Katie. However, without the knowledge of either party, the truck was actually destroyed by fire a few hours before their contract was formed. Given, given that neither party was aware that the truck had been destroyed, a mutual mistake has occurred and rescission is available for either party. A unilateral mistake is when only one party is mistaken about a material fact. So a unilateral mistake is generally not a basis for rescission by the mistaken party. Now, of course, if it was if that misrepresented material fact was done intentionally or with gross negligence, then there's absolutely a case for fraud. But if that's really not the case, um, <clears throat> then there's no basis for rescission unless one of the exceptions is met at the top of page 466, and you can read through those um, yourself. Okay, and then we have duress and undue influence, which are really close cousins. So duress is where somebody is forcing you, maybe through physical means, through psychological means, to sign a contract um, that you don't wanna sign. Okay, contracts under duress are voidable by the innocent party. Um, so this is when someone, you know, maybe says, we're going to pull out your tooth with a pair of pliers if you don't sign this contract. Um, <clears throat> undue influence is similar. It's where somebody's forcing you to do something you don't wanna do, sign a contract, and they are using their authority over you, their position over you, as leverage for you to sign a contract. So um, say, you know, maybe it's your boss or someone who works above you. They are, um, you see it a lot in employment type relationships, but it doesn't have to be. It could also be your parent, your lawyer, your doctor, Someone is trying to get you to sign an unfavorable contract, and those are also voidable by the innocent party. Okay. The next topic I want to talk about, I want to talk about two topics, really. The statute of frauds and the parole evidence rule. So the statute of frauds actually has absolutely nothing to do with fraud. I don't know how we came up with this name, probably blame it on England, but it has nothing to do with fraud, all right? All the statute of frauds means is what contracts have to be in writing. Remember I gave an example at the beginning of this lecture about real estate, and I said real estate has to be in writing, okay? So um, there are a number of things that have to be in writing. Um, Agreements for the sale of interest in land. Agreements for the sale of goods for $500 or more. Agreements to answer for the debt of another. And agreements made in contemplation of marriage. So that's discussed on page 467. These agreements must be in writing. Now, it does not have to be one piece of writing. So it can be multiple documents that when you put them together, make a contract, okay? It doesn't have to be one piece of paper that's on the table that has all the elements of a contract. It doesn't have to be, so long as it is each thing is in writing. It has to have the description of the parties and the subject matter, the essential terms, the consideration, and the signatures of the parties against whom it will be enforced. Okay. 
Um, <clears throat> and then the next topic I want to discuss is the parole evidence rule. So the parole evidence rule is an interesting little topic. This means after you already have a contract, so you have a valid contract, can you introduce additional evidence in court, okay, that basically says this was not the summation of our agreement. There's some sort of ancillary document out there that changes what is in the main body of the contract. Um, it trumps it, basically. So, generally, you want to know when can you introduce evidence of other written or oral agreements to supplement a contract that is already in existence. So, if your contract says this agreement is intended to be final and a complete expression of the parties, look at your lease agreement for your house, for your apartment. I'll bet you it has this provision in it where it says it is intended to be final and a complete expression of the parties. I forgot what that clause is called. There's a specific word for what that clause is called. It doesn't say in the book, but it has a specific word. Lawyers know it. I should know it. I don't. Um, <clears throat> But if it has that provision in there, it means parole evidence or evidence outside of the contract, whether written or oral, cannot be used to change the terms of a contract. There are exceptions. So even if a contract has that language in there, you can use parole evidence if it proves circumstances that make the contract void, voidable, or unenforceable. Okay? If is explaining the meaning of an ambiguous term in the contract. A lot of litigation has on that right there, that ambiguous term in the contract. Or if it relates to a subsequent modification or a rescission. Okay, so we're going to do um, one more video here on uh, the last topics in this chapter.